Welcome to Know the Cause. Thank you for joining me today and thank you for teaching your friends how to understand the etiology, Know the Cause. What about cauliflower jambalaya? Abby's over in the kitchen toward the end of today's show. You're going to love it. Dr. Mark Stengler from San Diego is an NMD, naturopathic medical doctor. How does that differ from a medical doctor? We'll ask him. He's going to be on with us today. Can fungus cause depression? Little secret I'm going to teach you today. Antidepressants called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors seem to annihilate fungus. Gee, maybe that's why they work for depression. And finally, trust science, but always as though your life depends on it. Verify. All that and more on this. Know the cause. For the past 45 years, I have dedicated my life and my whole career to finding the root cause of disease. And I now know with certainty that we must play a role in our own health care. I'm a self-care advocate, and you know what? Every time you change your diet for the better, exercise, or swallow a nutritional supplement, so are you. Now welcome to Know the Cause. You know, friends, I've heard the word trust over and over and over again through 2020. Wow, what happened? The faith we had in our medical community and in the CDC and FDA and so forth has somewhat eroded. We've been asking, you know, what's going on here? And, and I think justifiably so. It's not just medicine. It's all fields. Um, but I, I wanted to put together a little five-minute presentation here to help you a little bit because there are places we should put our trust, our faith, and there are places that, that we need more work on, okay? So let's start here. Trust in science, but verify. 19th century English pastor Charles Spurgeon, have you ever read about this guy? Wow. Challenged the accepted dogma of the time that science is always right and should be trusted. He asks, which science should be trusted? The science of 50 years ago? the science of today, or the science that will exist in 50 years. Welcome to 2020. Um, I think we're justified in asking, uh, didn't you ask, should we wear masks, shouldn't we? Do we get a vaccine? Is it mandated? Uh, do we take, you know, remdesivir? Do we take hydroxychloroquine? What's going on? Why can't all doctors get together and say, here's the way we're going to go? It just wasn't that way, okay? Okay, uh, science through the centuries, it's kind of always been this way as I was putting this PowerPoint uh, presentation together. Look, the world's flat. Titanic is unsinkable. The hydrogen in Hindenburg burned quickly and safely. Don't worry about it. When I was born in 1949, four out of five doctors smoked camel cigarettes. And they actually went on to say, you know, they're, they're, because it was better on our throat, better for the respiratory system, etc. Female hormone replacement therapy prevented cancer and stroke. So we thought. Medical mistakes are now the third leading cause of death in America. And I could have done six more graphics on this. You've lived long enough. You know this. But I stopped there. And I want to just back up to the year 2007 with a study of fungus, folks. If fungus was taught in medical school, clinical mycology it's called, and if clinical nutrition was taught in medical school, I don't think we'd have the problems in medicine we have today. Okay, and I'll prove that to you. Science 13 years ago. Fungi are the cause of many outbreaks of disease, but are mostly ignored. Who said this? The Academy of Microbiology? Big organization. Lots of docs. Fungi can cause a number of life-threatening diseases. Many people, scientists among them, are largely unaware. So, fungus can injure or kill us, yet our doctors are largely unaware. That was a few years ago, 13 years ago, they were saying that. It's becoming different. The Center for Disease Control said the last three years, think fungus, doctors. I don't know if it's falling on deaf ears, but think fungus. And then there's this. Why weren't we warned about the dangers of fungus long ago? Actually, we were. Leviticus 13, four, uh, 34 when you enter the land of Canaan, which I am giving you as your possession, I put a spreading mildew in a house in that land. The owner of the house must go and tell the priest, I have seen something that looks like mildew in my house. And then you guys probably know this, mold, mildew, and leprosy are biblical synonyms. And then I pulled out this old life application Bible. And look at what it says. The footnote, Leviticus uh, 14, what is it, 34. 
It says, uh, ta -ta. why was mildew so dangerous? This fungus could spread rapidly and promote disease. You mean medical books don't teach that? And the Bible does? Where should we put our faith? This is old. New books, oh, bacteria causes problems, viruses cause... Fungus? We don't know much about fungus. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't this be mandated, folks? Let me end on this, uh, on this graphic. Today we know a certainty that fungus kill, fungi kill about 1.5 million people globally every year. In perspective, this is more people than have died of COVID in the year 2020. Fungal deaths are annual. 15 million people have died of fungal diseases in the past 10 years. 20 years, it'll be 30 million. Yet the demand, uh, the study of fungi remains a small field with limited demand, requiring individuals with strong interest in fungi. Unfortunately, medical schools don't teach much about this fungi. I'm not asking you to put your doctor up against a wall and question him or her. You're the other adult in that exam room. Talk about fungus. Study it first. It's all out there. Hey friends, many years ago my wife and I were able to help a young girl who suffered from horrible, seemed like irretractable, depression. How did we do this? We recommended a couple of supplements. I happened to knew her doc I knew her doctor, and so I asked if it would be okay. We started her on a couple of supplements that just kill fungus. I mean, caprylic acid and the B vitamins. We started her on those, and we put her on a specialized diet. At the time, it was known as the Phase 1 diet. Today, that is the Kaufman diet. And do you know her depression got lifted? We used to walk and jog early in the morning down at the beach in California. And we'd see her on occasion, and she, her name was Mary, and she'd get better and better and better. And we just high-fived each other. Folks, sometimes there's a fungal component to depression. And I think... Many times there is a fungal component. However, antidepressants are tricky. Do not stop them on your own. Tell your doctor, I don't know if I want to stay on these the rest of my life. I don't know if I want to be managed. Can you help me see if there is a fungal component to this? I was on lots of antibiotics. I turned 21 and started drinking like crazy. Both of those things expose you to fungal poisons, mycotoxins, that might be, and they are, neurotoxic. Uh, we've known penicillin was neurotoxic since 1945. Not when you took it as a little boy or a little girl, but sometimes decades later the depression can ensue. Let's go through this. Can fungus cause depression? In 2001, what, 20 years ago, researchers tested five commonly used antidepressant drugs, these are called SSRIs, against aspergillus mold or aspergillus fungi. Hmm, fascinating. Their findings. The five SSRIs, I quote this uh, research article, tested in the study displayed different potencies with respect to both antifungal killing and lag of fungal regrowth. It is probable that antifungal activity results from an interaction of SSRIs with the fungal transporter systems. Really? Really? The, the antifungal activity results from an interaction with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the pills, and the fungal transporter system? Or could it be, look at the bottom, or could it be that fungus causes depression? I'll never forget when they uh, began to repurpose uh, this antifungal drug for toenail fungus over to cancer. They say, well, the way this thing works uh, for cancer is it seems to inhibit the hedgehog pathway of cancer. Hold on. It kills fungus. Could fungus be causing cancer? Because it works real well for cancer, okay? Uh, here we have that again. Okay, after all, antidepressants kill fungus. Aspergillus molds are not uncommon in our food supply and in the air we breathe. Some aspergillus mold species produce a neurotoxic mycotoxin called cyclopiazonic acid. When you kill fungus, as these SSRIs now do, you saw the paper, you stop them from producing neurotoxic mycotoxins like cyclopiazonic acid. Folks, it just, to me, this makes so much sense. Look, Doc, I don't really care why I have this. I'm deep, I'm dark, I'm depressed, I cry. I see so many ads on TV about schizophrenia now. Why? Boy, that's a weird year, 2020. Okay, 
maybe it's because you've gotten exposed to a lot of mold when you were younger. If I had this problem, here's what I'd do. Rule out a fungal cause. Then I'd find a physician willing to let me experiment with dietary changes for a few weeks. Fungi thrive on sugars or carbs, as do many depressed people. I'd elevate my feel-good brain hormones by naturally, uh, naturally by, regular, uh, by exercising on a regular basis. I'm getting ahead of myself. Then, if I was stable, I'd talk to my doctor about using harmless supplements like L-tryptophan, SAM-E, omega-3 fatty acids, St. John's wort, all that have antifungal properties instead of drugs. I'd starve fungus to stop it from spreading by following the Kaufman One diet for a minimum of 30 days. I hope that helps. It's worth an effort. Work with your doctor. While he's here in studio, Dr. Mark Stengler, a good friend of mine from the San Diego area, he came to interview me today, and we'll talk about that. You'll learn about that here in a, a few months down the line. I have a few questions I want to ask you. Number one, thank you for seeing the people that I send to you. They love you. Mm. Tell folks you're a NMD, a naturopathic medical doctor. What, what do you do differently, and why do all these people email me and say, this guy is amazing? <laughs> what, thank you for being who you are. Oh, thank you. Well, as a naturopathic medical doctor, what I do is I use modern science. Use lab tests people are familiar with. Blood tests, do a physical exam, diagnosis, get a patient's symptoms. But then that's really where the differences change. I try and focus on using more holistic, natural treatments. Yes. At times, we'll use antibiotics and other medications, although at our clinic, with the other two doctors that work with me, we've calculated it's less than 5% wow. of recommendations. Wow. So it doesn't matter if you got a cold, a flu, a cough, you know, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, all these types of things, you know, we treat naturally. So we believe that using natural treatments is just much more compatible with the human body. We can treat the root of causes more effectively and we get much, much less side effects. And so it's kind of this field of integrative medicine. So mm -hmm. being trained in both types of medicine, I like to use the technology, but focus on the natural treatments, especially very big on nutrition. People cannot prevent and treat disease unless their nutritional status is at a good level. What year did you graduate from medical school? 91, uh, 95. In 1995, where was your heart on this question? How many fungal patients a day will you see? How many did you think you would see after graduating from medical school? Well, the medical school I went to, because it already had integrative medicine into it, oh. more than most. However, at that time, it was more just some skin things right. and irritable bowel syndrome related to candida. Outside of that, I didn't know the connection between autoimmune diseases, cancer, memory problems, yep. mood problems, things like that. So it's really, you know improved a lot obviously since then, but yeah, so it was still semi-basic at the time. It's interesting that these people who get back with me and say, I love the guy, thank you for the referral, uh, all say the same thing, and that is you listened. It's almost Doug like he learned from my story. The typical patient in a medical office, and I understand this having worked with groups of doctors, gets 11 seconds to tell their story <laughs> before the doctor. You sat down with one person that I sent to you for 15 minutes, she said she told her story. You didn't, you know, interrupt at all. Is listening an important part of what you do? Oh, it's critical. And studies have shown that because in medicine, what we're trying to do, or we should be trying to do, is treating the root cause, know the cause mm -hmm. of a problem. Now, sometimes it's one main cause. Sometimes there's multiple causes mixed in. If you just presume you know what's causing it with a patient, you're probably going to miss the boat. And usually we find with patients, they know to a large degree what the cause was. When did their illness begin? What kind of diet were they consuming? Was there much alcohol? Pharmaceutical medications? Other stresses in their life? This can tell us a lot really what's probably been triggering their health problems. And so by treating those root problems, we're going to help them much more effectively than just trying to mask the symptoms with pharmaceutical mm. drugs. Are you seeing a trend in people wanting to get off of medications, coming to you saying, you know, I want to try oregano or clove or, or an herb instead of this medication? And I know that's your background. You've written many books on this, so you can help right. them. Oh, absolutely. I think people have come to the realization that they had a blind faith, unfortunately, in pharmaceutical treatments being wonder drugs. A lot of people feel like they, they got taken, so to speak. Now, not that they don't have a place. It can right, be phenomenal right. for acute infections and acute pain control and all that. But in general, for most common conditions, for most 
chronic conditions, yep. they can cause more harm than good in a lot of cases. Are we overdoing statins in America today? Oh, I mean, a, bar, a large part of what I do in my practice is go through the patient's history. About 95% of people come into my practice on statin drugs, I take them off. Mm, I take okay. them off. Yeah. Um, and that's based on science. Yeah. I'm You're very right. good science. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny, folks, but Dr. Stengler and I get to talk a lot. You know, we email each other. He's busy, I'm busy, and at 9 o'clock at night I get these emails. What's fascinating to me is the number of people taking drugs. Seventy percent of Americans take at least one drug. And they're not done, Mark. They want a hundred percent of people to take drugs. And you bring out very accurately that sometimes they're needed, but not seventy percent of Americans. Well, and if you're a senior, I mean, studies show, depending on what study you look at, you're on five or more pharmaceuticals, and of course, we're just in the infancy of knowing how drugs interact with one another, causing more side effects and damage. Nutrients they deplete, that's in its infancy too. Yeah. All drugs typically deplete you of various nutrients you need for proper healthy immune and body functioning. And so, again, you have to make sure these medications you're on are really indicated. We spend a lot of time in our clinic weaning people off medications, treating with diet, nutritional supplements. They feel much better, partly because they're just not getting the side effects from their medications anymore. Well, thank you for what you do. I mean, people I've sent to you are just overwhelmed mm -hmm. and overjoyed. Thank you. Well, thank you. Dr. Mark Stengler. Hi guys, welcome back to my kitchen. My name is Abby and today I'm going to show you how to make Kaufman approved jambalaya. I've already got in my pot, it's already starting to cook, I've got some chopped up celery, uh, a red bell pepper, a yellow bell pepper, and some onions. And I'm just trying to saute that in some olive oil right now to get everything nice and soft. Okay, so my peppers and onions and everything have softened up a little bit, so right now I'm gonna add in the chopped garlic. And this is about four cloves of minced garlic. Put that in. And then we're just going to cook it for about another minute. Okay, once the garlic has started to brown a little bit, we're going to add in our already chopped up sausage. Now this is a sausage that I found at Costco. Uh, it's just an all natural organic beef sausage. There's no additives or anything in it. It's pretty good, it's Kaufman approved, and I just happened to find it. So when you're looking around for things to eat, don't be afraid to just take your time and look through the ingredients of stuff that you may not have considered before, because I just happened to find it. So yeah. We're just gonna let that cook for a little bit until the sausage starts to get a little bit brown. Okay, my sausage is just starting to brown now, so I'm gonna go ahead and add in some pre-cooked chicken breast. I've got it cubed up, so it's nice little bite-sized pieces. This is just some chicken that I had left over that was already cooked, so I'm just gonna go and mix it through. You don't have to cook it, you're just trying to heat it up right now. Okay, and from here, we are going to add in our cauliflower rice. We've got some crushed tomatoes and some chicken stock. Yeah, chicken stock and then our Cajun seasoning. So let's go ahead and put in cauliflower rice. Our tomatoes. The chicken broth. and our Cajun seasoning. Now this particular Cajun seasoning already has salt in it, so I'm not gonna add any extra, but if you, if the one that you're using doesn't have salt in, now is where you would put it in. And then we're just gonna mix all this up, and then bring it to a simmer, and let it simmer uh, to the point where the cauliflower starts to get kind of soft and tender. All right, my cauliflower rice is nice and tender. So now our next step 
the pretty much final step is we're gonna add in some raw shrimp. Now shrimp cooks pretty fast. So what you wanna do is you're gonna let this simmer for about another, I don't know, maybe like four to five minutes. You basically wanna get the shrimp completely cooked and as much of the liquid out as you can. Okay, my jambalaya is done. I've got most of the liquid reduced. It is gonna be a little bit liquidy from the, uh, the tomatoes and some of the water that the cauliflower releases, but it's still good. And let's go ahead and put some in a bowl. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. Okay. This smells amazing. It's very hot, it just turned off. But you can see you've got the sausage, it's browned up nice. It, you've got the little bits of chicken. We've got all the peppers in there. The shrimps are evenly cooked. Everything looks super good. Let's go ahead and have a taste. Mm. It's so good. The seasoning is amazing. I personally love jambalaya. I constantly get jambalaya. Whew, it's hot. I constantly get jambalaya at restaurants and I like it just as spicy, if not a little bit more, and it is fantastic. Please make this recipe at home. It's great for like bulk cooking because this whole pot would last me for probably a week. So if you've got a big family, if you've got friends coming over, make this, serve it to them. They will absolutely love it, especially if they love that kind of Cajun New Orleans food. It's so good. You can find this whole recipe at knowthecause.com. This is all Kaufman approved. This is all Kaufman one approved actually. But again, you can find the entire recipe, including the Cajun seasoning mix. I've got that in a separate little thing that you can pre-make and just have on hand if you want. But yeah, let me know how, you, how much you like it. Let us know on Facebook and have a great day. Dr. Julia Schulenberg, you've seen her on this show, is a naturopathic doctor. Dr. Stengler is a naturopathic medical doctor. There is a difference. Uh, I would love, look, if I had a doctor, it would be a naturopathic medical doctor or a naturopathic doctor. I'm just telling you, that's what I would do. Uh, Abby and her cauliflower jambalaya, oh, it smelled in that kitchen amazing. Look at the way it looked today. And what would I do if I were depressed? Folks, I'd look for something some mold somewhere, especially if these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Zoloft and the like, just happen to kill fungus. Is that how they work? Is depression a sign of a fungal disorder? Maybe not all, but some must be. Trust science, but always verify when you're swallowing chemicals. God bless you folks. Tell a friend to know the cause and I'll see you next time.